Depoliad, Chapter 3 The Appearance of the Bold Man The next morning, upon moving the bandage aside, Korotkov was satisfied that his eye was almost better. Nonetheless, the excessively cautious Korotkov decided against removing the bandage for the time being. Arriving for work very late, the cunning Korotkov went straight through to his room so as not to excite any misinterpretation amongst the junior office workers and found on his desk a document in which the manager of the supply subsection asked the depot manager whether a uniform was to be issued to the tips tipists. Having read the document with his right eye, Korotkov picked it up and set off down the corridor to the office of Comrade Chekushin, the depot manager. And it was right by the door of the office that Korotkov bumped into a stranger whose appearance amazed him. This stranger was so short that he only came up as far as the tall Korotkov's waist. The lack of height found compensation in the extreme breadth of the stranger's shoulders, his square trunk set on crooked legs, and the left one, moreover, was lame. But most non noteworthy of all was his head. It constituted of an exact gigantic model of an egg set hori horizontally on the neck and with the pointed end at the front. It was bald like an egg too, and so shiny that electric light bulbs glowed on the stranger's crown without ever going out. The stranger's tiny face had been shaved until it was blue, and his green eyes, as small as pinheads, sat in deep hollows. The stranger's body was clothed in an unbuttoned service jacket, made out of a great blanket, from beneath which peeped an embroidered little Russian shirt, and his legs were in trousers of the same material, and the low-cut boots of a hussar from the time of Alexander I. Little weirdo, thought Korotkov, and headed towards Chikushin's door, trying to avoid the belt man. But quite unexpectedly, the latter barred Korotkov's way. What do you want? the bold man asked Korotkov in such a voice that the highly strung chief clerk winced. That voice was exactly like the voice of a copper basin and was notable for having such timbre that at each word everyone who heard it had the sensation of a rough wire running down their spine. Apart from that, it seemed to Korotkov that the unknown man's words smelt of matches. Despite all this, the short-sighted Korotkov did what he shouldn't have done under any circumstances. He took offense. Hmm, rather strange, I'm taking a document, but permit me to know who you... Do you see what's written on the door? Korotkov looked at the door and saw the long familiar sign report before entering. And I do have a report, said Korotkov foolishly, indicating his document. The bold square man unexpectedly grew angry, his little eyes flashed with yellowish sparks. You, comrade, he said, deafening Korotkov with the noise of saucepans, are so backward that you don't understand the meaning of the simplest office signs. I'm truly amazed at how You've remained in work until now. There's a lot of interesting things here generally. These black eyes are at every turn, for example. Well, never mind. We'll put it all in order. Ah, uh, Korotkov gasped to himself. Give it here. And with those final words, the unknown man tore the document from Korotkov's hands, read it in an instant, pulled the chewed, indeliable pencil from his trouser pocket, held the document up against the wall and wrote a number of slanting words. Be off, he bellowed. 
and jabbed to document at Korotkov in such a way that he almost poked out his last remaining guy. The Athestor howled and swallowed the unknown man while Korotkov remained rooted to the spot. There was no sign of Chakushin in the office. The disconcerted Korotkov came round half a minute later when he ran into Lidochka Deruni, Comrade Chakushin's personal secretary. Ah, Comrade Korotkov gasped. Lidochka's eyes were swaddled in exactly the same individual dressing material, the only difference being that the ends of the bandage were tied in a coquettish bow. What happened to you? Matches, Lidochka replied irritably. The damned things. Who's that man in there? The crestfallen Korotkov asked in a whisper. Didn't you know? whispered Lidochka. He's new. How's that? Korotkov squeaked. What about Chikushin? He was sacked yesterday, said Lidochka crossly, and added, jabbing a finger in the direction of the office. What a goose! Now he really is a dodgy character. I've never seen anyone so disagreeable in my life. He yells, and you're fired, baldy pants. She added unexpectedly, so that Korotkov goggled at her. What's his name? Korotkov didn't have time to ask. Behind the office door, the terrible voice crashed out. Kuria, the chief clerk, and the secretary instantly flew off in different directions. Flying into his room, Korotkov sat down at the desk and made his speech to himself. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Well, Korotkov, you're in a pickle. This little matter needs to be put right. Backward. Hmm, the cheek. All right. You see how backward Korotkov is. And with one eye, the chief clerk read the bald man's writing. On the document were the slanting words. All tipped with typists and women generally will in due course be issued soldiers uniform drawers. That's fantastic, Korotkov exclaimed in rapture and gave a voluptuous shudder imagining Lidochka in soldiers' drawers. He took out a clean sheet of paper forthwith and in three minutes had written Telephoned telegram, manager supply subsection, stop. In reply your memo, number 0 0.15015.6 of 19th, comma, main match mat informs that all typists and women generally will in due course be issued soldiers uniforms draws stop manager dash signature chief clerk dash varfalame korotkov stop he rang a bell and when the courier pantelemon came he said to him to the manager for signature pantelemon chewed his lips for a moment, took the document, and left the room. For four hours thereafter, Korotkov listened intently without leaving his room, on the basis that, if the new manager took it into his head to make a round of the premises, he would be sure to find him buried in his work. But no sound came from the terrible office. Only once did the muffled cast-iron voice reach him, seemingly threatening to fire someone. But whom exactly Korotkov couldn't hear, even though he put his ear to the keyhole. At 3.30 p.m., Pantelemon's voice rang out beyond the wall of the general office. He's driven off in a car. The general office at once became noisy and everybody dis dispersed. Later than anyone else, Comrade Korotkov left in solitude, or home 